was to summarize the first several uh, works on the list of works for Art History 1. The first work is from prehistory. It's called The Venus of Willendorf, and uh, were you to have it on the test, you would identify its, its time period as prehistoric, and, and, and that's all. That's all we know about it. Uh, don't even know how old it is. It's probably tens of thousands of years old. Um, it is one of, of numerous works like it that have been found around Europe, usually in burial places. If you look in your book, you will see background information on it, the speculations as what it's for uh, and why it is the way it is. Um, and it's, it's not known for sure. What we have is a, a, a female figure, and the, it's very exaggerated. It's very bulbous looking. The, 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 the breast, the belly, and the thighs and the head are all rounded, swelling parts. And those you can think of as being emphasized while, while the, uh, the feet and lower legs are very de-emphasized. And the face is completely gone. The arms, which you see here, uh, are attached to the body. We see the, the uh, side view. You can see how they're almost in relief on the body. They're, they're completely uh, uh, attached. And, and there's a practical reason for this, and, you know, which is if, if they were to stick out in some way, they would, they would easily break off. Uh, but also uh, looking at to see what, what parts of the body are emphasized and what's, what parts are de-emphasized. The arms can be uh, you know, thought of as being de-emphasized because they're not as important, or they're not the parts that the artist wanted to, to emphasize. The parts that are emphasized have to do with um, exaggerated female features, probably uh, in relation to, to reproduction. Uh, uh, it, it looks like a, a, a fertility uh, idol, or talisman, or some sort of charm. It's very small, even though it looks monumental in scale when you look at it uh, without reference to any other object. It's, it's, it, it's very small, it's only like four inches tall, and uh, it would fit in your, your hand. This looks, it's sort of like a small potato. And you can, one of the note things that you might notice is that it has a belly button, right? There where a belly button ought to be, but it's, it's a pit in the, in the stone, probably one that was already in existence. Like you can imagine someone picking up a stone and it had a kind of a, uh, a human figure shape to it already. And the artist job was to was to carve on it some to emphasize those bits so that you could recognize it as a figure. Now, it, you know, I don't know what they what tool they would use. This is probably before they had metal tools, and it's probably too small to be chiseled on. So we probably abraded with uh, some other rock so as to get the the lines to separate the belly from the legs and the knees and the and, and around the breast and around the, the neck to to separate those those parts so that you can see one part from another. Um, it all maybe drilled a little bit, um, maybe just with a tool in the hand, just rubbing against it to create these little pits to make a pattern where the where the head ought to be, um, or, or where the where the face ought to be, but it's completely covered up. It might be covered up for the purpose of being a generic person rather than a uh, a specific person. It might be a representation of a goddess. Or it might be, that, you know, as 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 was thought when it was first found. It, the reason it was called Venus of Willendorf, long before Venus, the actual uh, uh, mythological figure, was thought of. But if they had some sort of religion that involved some sort of uh, fertility goddess or or, or something of, along those lines, uh, you know, this could be a representation of it. But we don't know. It might be just the representation of the idea of female fertility for the purpose of uh, hoping fertility upon someone else when the, that you bestow the gift upon. Um, we will look in, the, in, the, in, in this course at lots of different uh, representations of the, of, the, of the figure, and this is just one of them, and we will see how this differs from ones that come after this. This we can think of as a you know, from a primitive society. Primitive just meaning first, not necessarily lower in quality. Uh, we don't know what, what the people who lived at this time did generally. We just have a few fragments and, 
uh, in samples. And, we, and it may be that the way this looks is, uh, you know, th the best that they could do with the tools that they had. Or it might be this is a, 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 a simpler version of something that they would normally make in a more sophisticated manner. Don't know. But it's, it's something we can compare uh, uh, because we are going to look at uh, a, a theme in, in many different figures where some artists uh, emphasize what they think of as the ideal aspect of a, of a figure and others a more naturalistic uh, approach. And we'll talk about ideal and natural as a kind of two ends of a spectrum. And most things are going to be somewhere in that spectrum. That is, nothing is absolutely ideal without any natural qualities, and nothing is absolutely natural or perfectly representational exactly the way you would see it in real life. There's some sort of distortion that comes with uh, making any work. And, uh, and the desire to make something perfect or make the perfect version of a thing uh, existed a, for, for almost almost all of the works for the uh, in the ancient world a desire to make something the the, the the ideal but ideals are different from one society to another and this is uh, a representation of an ideal that is different than what we will see later so that's a prehistory you know the, the one example that we have of a sculpture for painting we have cave paintings these were found you know in many places in Europe the first ones like this one in Alaska and in France uh, is is one of those things that w was a big surprise in the 1800s when it was first discovered such a surprise that they didn't know didn't believe that they were even real deep inside of caves far away uh, from the entrances, ones that you might take a day to hike through to get to, um, using just oil lamps made out of, you know, animal fat or something, uh, you know, before they had even candles, in, into, into places in the deep, dark recesses of these caves, they find uh, uh, drawings on the wall or paintings on the wall made out of, you know, paints from plants that they that they you know ground up and mixed with water and applied sometimes with a brush and sometimes with just putting some in your mouth and spitting it in a kind of a spray onto the wall but again if you read the book on this you'll see uh, lots of examples of of, uh, of you know archaeologists and uh, the the you know, theorize about what these are for, what what was the the the, you know, the, the purpose of them, the the rationale behind them, what's what's going on in them. Uh, it's there's just a whole lot of speculation going on because because nobody knows, and there's the the only evidence there is is the pictures, and they sometimes have some bones and some um, charred sticks and things that are that are lying around, but there's not really any um, um, obvious reason for these. Could be that they're for training purposes. It could be there's some sort of religious significance, some sort of a talisman-like effect where you draw a, a picture of a successful hunt so as to have a successful hunt. Hunt. Um, I don't know, but what we're looking at is 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 pictures of of things that the um, the artist had seen out in the outside world and come into this very secluded place with. Uh, a candle and some and some uh, drawing materials, and making pictures on the walls. And these things are very ancient. Some of them are many tens of thousands of years old. And sometimes among the same pictures are things that are, you know, thousands of years apart themselves. So they would return to these things generation after generation after generation, adding more and more pictures. Um, but when I say that they saw things on the outside world and came in and depicted them inside, um, you'll notice that there are things about them that they don't actually see in the outside world. For example, um, the line around this bull. That's, something, that's not something they would have seen in the outside world. If people think bulls don't have lines around them. And, you know, if, if they didn't have a, 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 
a convention already, then whoever made this may have just invented the convention of putting a line around something so as to tell you where the borders are. You know, this this is the, a line around something is a kind of a, a psychological thing. You know that an object such as a, an ox or your or your own body has a a, a skin, a, a a place where it meets the outside, an edge, uh, where one thing leaves off and the air begins. Uh, and that, that's a strong psychological thing to have about your own body and about other things. Uh, and, and to draw a line, to represent that, that demarcation between the thing and the, and the, the figure and the ground, is, as we say, um, is not something that's obvious. It's not something that you see. It's something that you think. And notice that linear things, is what you would call this, are, exist on this wall in addition to ones that are more tonal. This is closer to the way things look. But even when you look at, consider the way things look, um, you don't always see a, a, a cow like this from the side in a profile view. I mean, you see it from many different views, but the artist has chosen this view. Uh, and, and if you look at most of the, of the animals in this picture, and indeed in, in just about any of the, the pictures, they will pick, uh, pick side views and profile views uh, or, or frontal views of things uh, because those are the ones that are uh, more recognizable. You know, if you're only going to have a small amount of information to distinguish this animal from another, another one, um, those distinguishing features are the things that, you're, that are important to you. Uh, even when it, you know, there, there's some distortion involved, like for example, this cow, the body seems much large, larger in proportion to its head and its legs than, than an actual cow would be. And one might think, well, maybe just like the Venus of Villendorf, they're emphasizing something that they want, that they think is important and de-emphasizing others. Like the legs aren't important. Is if you're if you're hunting for food, well, this is where the food lives, um, not in the legs. And so, distorting things for the purpose of 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 showing what you think is important, you know, seems to be a theme uh, between this and the last work. Another thing is that the the horns are not seen from the same point of view as the side of the side of the of the animal. You know, the animal is in in this position, and if the head were in this position, the horns wouldn't look like this. They would be coming toward you or away from you, not in this in this uh, configuration. And again, the artist has decided to distort something for uh, you know for the purpose of of depicting what he, the way he wants it to be depicted. This in this case, having the horns seen in this view. They're much more recognizable from this point of view than they would be uh, from the from the profile view, so it's necessary to distort, and uh, many things are, are distorted. Just the fact that, like this head, is much larger than this head over here. It could have been done earlier, much earlier, maybe centuries earlier or later. I don't, I don't know. Uh, these these other animals they could be represented as far away, or they could be represented as smaller. You know, we don't know, but it's 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 interesting that the the artist or artists who were responsible for these um, were almost like they were they're inventing pictorial uh, conventions that we still use now. In fact, these you know these look like a Picasso drawing, uh, and it's it's a very fine drawing. I mean, it's you feel that the weight of the thing, you can feel the the. Uh, uh, the, the proportions of it, all, 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 all things give you, you know, the power of the animal, the, the wildness of the animal, um, and, and, you know, you, you, it conveys in a very, uh, a very efficient way, in a very uh, dynamic way, you know, a living thing. And remember that this person is, is in the dark and very far away from, from whatever animal he's drawing, and he's drawing from it from his imagination. And it's a... Uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a difficult thing to do. But anyway, this is painting in in uh, in the prehistoric times. This this is just one example. If you go look online, you'll find lots of other different examples, and there 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 are many of them. Some of them are just only only recently discovered, and uh, it's very interesting that you know things that haven't been seen 
uh, for for you know maybe tens of thousands of years are coming to light, and and we see things that we recognize as uh, you know art conventions that we still have. All right, prehistory in the world of uh, architecture. This is Stonehenge in in England and on the Salisbury Plain. You have some pictures of it. You see it's made out of great big tall stones that, that weigh a lot. They were brought from a long distance and put into this configuration. It's not exactly a building. It's a, uh, a marker, like a, uh, it's a big uh, grave site. And this would be a place where rituals would be performed uh, that oftentimes, you know, burial ceremonies, because, you know, once you bury someone in a place, you know, that place becomes special, and then you bury more people, and as, uh, as time goes on, and, you, and this becomes the place where you bury special people, the place becomes more and more special, so it's worth investing, uh, you know, in some stuff, and altars, you know, stone markers, things like that, like we, like we do in cemeteries, but for these people who live, this is probably in the you know, become maybe 3000 BC or so. Um, it's called prehistory, even though there is some history going on in other parts of the world where they have written history, and, and uh, we will see later for, for Egypt begins at this time. Uh, but in England, this is, you know, still prehistory. Um, these people put these, the, these rocks in, in, a, in a circle, and they seem to have some sort of uh, meaning to them, and, and if you've you know, read anything about them, you'll notice that they have uh, things line up at certain times of the year, especially the equinox and the uh, solstices. It's, they're marked so that if you stand at a certain place when the sun rises, it rises, rises right between two stones in, in such a way that you know, makes it, it gives the impression that they put it there for that reason. And so it's, it's a little more sophisticated than simply piling some stones one on top of another. But the you know this is this is prehistory this is primitive so um, but it still has something that we're going to be looking at later uh, that is the post and lintel system you have vertical things and horizontal things that are on top of them uh, much of the world's architecture are this kind of a, uh, uh, this kind of architecture where you have a post and a lintel lintel is the thing is the horizontal thing on the on the top and. Notice that it has a certain proportion, how thick the things are that are the posts and how thick the things are that are the lentils. And there, there's a reason for that because, you know, there's, there's properties of, of stone is such that when you put something over here, you know, the, the gravity is pushing down on it and it's going to, um, stone is kind of a brittle thing and uh, it can't take much what we call tension. And there's tension right here. And if this were a thin piece of stone, you know, it would crack and break. So they had to make a thick enough piece of stone that it wouldn't break with this amount of span. As we will see in, in future generations, that, that becomes an issue. And the proportions of buildings such as the Parthenon and, you know, other, other buildings that, that are post and little buildings, uh, you know, they're part of the, what determines, you know, the size and how much stone you use for things. Uh, has to do with the the properties of stone. So let's move on to the uh, Mesopotamian world. Here's a map Mesopotamia here. Uh, there's Egypt down here with the Nile. And this is Saudi Arabia. Uh, Iran is here. Iraq is here. Turkey is here. And there's Greece and the Peloponnese is over there. Um, so you, you probably know from, from uh, history class, you know, this is the cradle of civilization and uh, places, different places in the world, including these two places and a few others are the ones where uh, civilization started. People moved from being nomads and uh, hunters and gatherers to uh, an agricultural society. We're going to look at the ones that are here and the ones that are, that are here. Uh, and tell the difference between the two. We start with this one, um, the Sumer. Sumer is going to be the uh, Sumerians, and the uh, Akkadians are here, and the Assyrians are here. Uh, the reason that there's 
different ones is because they lived at different times and that it started with one and another one, this one conquered this one and then this one conquered this one. And the reason there's a lot of conquering and, and changeover, it has to do with the fact that this is an alluvial plain and it's completely unguarded and 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 invaders could come from from anywhere and, and you know, kill people and take their stuff. And and because it's difficult to defend, being flat and uh, devoid of, of stone that you can make big fortifications with. But over time, you know, the, the Sumerians made some stuff and they were taken over and when they were taken over, you know, military, military people, uh, you know, they did build some fortifications and, and they made it um, bigger and powerful enough to, to attract uh, invader, another set of invaders, which were the Assyrians. And, and, and so it goes with, uh, with this area because of its geographical character. The Egyptians had a different story because they have a, a desert on the left here and the desert over here and they have the sea up here and there's actually mountains down in the bottom so um, they were protected and so they had a society that pretty much stayed the same for quite a long time from 3000 to um, you know say 500, 300 BC they were uh, you know, not quite 3000 years but very a very long time that they they maintain a very stable society and the character of their art shows uh, stability and, and continuity whereas in Mesopotamia here um, there's lots of changeover. So the earliest thing we're looking at is this lyre. It's a, it's a, it has a bull head on it made of gold. This is a reconstruction of all of this part. Uh, the part that we're going to be looking at is right here on the sort of the neck of the bull. You know, it's got, it has, it has gold, and it has lapis lazuli here, and there's semi-precious stone. So it's a, it's a valuable sort of thing, and something that people would strum and, you know, make music on. Uh, here's a closer picture. This is the part that we're going to look at. This is made out of some white material, like uh, maybe ivory or something, and the, and the black part is made out of bitumen, which is uh, kind of like tar or asphalt or something, and, and so it's just a, a black and white picture that looks, for all the world, like a like a comic. Uh, it's got a few figures that are very flat, flattened out, and and the the, the pictorial convention that we're going to see employed in, in the way this works is something we're going to see a lot of, especially in the ancient world. What's being illustrated here is is probably uh, a story from of, of a hero, like a, a mythological story from the area that they have uh, called the Gilgamesh. It's a, uh, an epic poem, uh, sort of like the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, which came later than this. But Gilgamesh is a hero like this, sort of a very strong man, and, and he, in this picture, this, this upper one, he seems to be holding or wrestling with or in some way uh, taking a selfie with uh, a couple of oxen, and the oxen have have uh, uh, human heads. In the next scene, we have uh, a procession of animals who are standing in a kind of a, uh, a human way, uh, anthropomorphized animal. There's a, a lion holding something, uh, maybe a lamp and and a, uh, a vessel of some kind. Maybe it's oil. These are, these look like they're going to a, a sacrifice. We have this is other this is like a jackal or a I don't know, a hyena or something, and it's, you know, wearing a shirt like a person, holding, using his thumbs and hands, you know, like a person. There's a little knife to do the sacrifice with, and there's some animal parts like you would have if you're going to a sacrifice. And I don't know exactly what the story is that's being told, but um, there's some music playing animals here. There's, a, there's a, a lyre, which is very similar to the one that this is on. Notice it has these the strings here, it has a frame, it has a... Uh, uh, a, a bull's head, just like this. There's the bull's head and the frame and everything. In fact, I imagine that the uh, reconstruction of this lyre was probably dependent upon this picture or ones similar to it. Looks like kind of a mule thing uh, with with hands playing, and a bear and some other. Looks like a kangaroo almost. I don't know. Uh, sitting and and here's here's a figure that's. Uh, harder to recognize. It has a human head and seemed to be human-like proportion, but the uh, body seems to be made, made of some sort of woven material and the uh, 
and a, a tail comes out of here that's kind of like what has what a scorpion might have. Uh, I don't know. I guess it was it may be a monster kind of character in the story. There's a, a goat holding some stuff, and they're also moving left here, just like these are moving left. So there's you know there's, there's a sort of some sort of story is being illustrated in, in these in these pictures, and whoever made it was probably confident that the people looking at it would know what the story was and would get it all. Since this is small and the medium is something that can't easily be made, uh, everything is simplified to just the basic shapes that are necessary to recognize a thing. But the, the thing that I want to want to point out, and the thing you might use to compare to other things that we're going to see in the future, that is other parts of, of uh, Mesopotamia and, and Egypt, and even when you get to to uh, to Greece, there will be kind of pictures that are like this, that are like Greek vase painting, for example, uh, where there's similarities and differences between the way they depict human figures, the way they pick, depict animals, how the convention of how to how to represent three-dimensional objects and three-dimensional living things uh, on a flat surface. And here, w one thing you notice is the way the figure is represented. You, you have, this is the head, and this is the shoulders here. Uh, the, the hips are sort of turned to the side, while well, the shoulders are frontal. Uh, the legs are also seen from the side. And the, and the, and the combination of the, like the upper half is frontal and the lower half is, is on the side, it's similar to what you saw in the, in the bull's horns in the cave painting, in that you're seeing uh, the same object, or the same thing, um, from two different points of view. Now, it is a, a, a pictorial convention that we're familiar with, uh, beginning, you know, much later in our history, uh, where things are generally seen from the same point of view. Well, that's a, that's a relatively new thing, to see, uh, have a picture of something seen from one point of view. Uh, it, it, that was begun in, you know, in, the, in the early 1400s, uh, in the Renaissance. But these people, and pretty much, you know, everybody before that period uh, had no problem whatsoever with seeing anything from multiple points of view at the same time, depending on what was necessary and what, you know, for whatever reason, whether it was to emphasize one thing or to de-emphasize de another thing, or to uh, uh, make something more recognizable, like a face. A face is very recognizable, seen frontally like this. Um, shoulders are seen, or you, you recognize shoulders, and you know the hand. You can see his hands go, his arms must go behind here, uh, and these little things are the hooves of the of the animals. One going up here, and one going down. Um, but hips and legs, you know, they're 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 more recognizable from the side, especially the feet. It's hard to see, recognize what a fit foot would look like if you look straight on at it. Uh, so, it's part of it's just for for clarity. Okay, why, why, you may be wondering, why is he holding the, the ox in this way? I don't know. It has to do what it, with whatever this story is being represented. But, and, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not worried about the story so much as the way, way things are, are depicted. Uh, let's look at another little feature here. You see, notice the nose is drawn with a line around it. Now, that's, that's not something that noses actually have. Now, we recognize it because we're, we're, we're familiar with cartoons and the way of drawing, and even, you know, as children, we would have drawn faces where you could just draw a line around it. And it's something we know because we know what our nose looks like, but we also, um, it would be very difficult to draw a way, the way a nose actually looks like in this medium. You know, you, you can only do black lines on a white surface, and the nose doesn't actually have the black lines. But if you understand that, you know, the convention that, Objects have a, you can put a black line to represent the edges of things, and that the edge of a nose where it, you know, slopes and, and intersects with the face, you know, a line is okay to put there. Well, um, we recognize it, so we, we, we understand that the original people who, who saw this would have recognized, oh, this is what, this is where the nose goes, and that's the way you depict a nose. And once you understand that, then uh, you can read images very easily. So let's move on uh, to the next people who, th that was uh, Sumerian. This is uh, Akkadian. And it's the, the head of the Akkadian uh, ruler that we have. And we have, I think, three in that category. Yes, we have three. 
this is a, a, a bronze head. Um, uh, it's called a head of an Akkadian ruler. I don't know which one, but there, there, there were several, several in a in a dynasty. Uh, bronze is is made by, you know, liquefying copper and tin together and pouring it into a mold, and the mold is designed, you know, so as to once you pour it pour it into the mold, it it uh, makes this hollow shell uh, with the outside being exactly the same shape is the original work that was made uh, in clay uh, that was that is being cast. Uh, it's a very sophisticated and technological achievement to make something like this, but it's, uh, um, uh, you know, you, you think of something as, you know, thousands of years old like this to have been, you know, to have a primitive look to it and to even have a, be made in a primitive way, but this was done very skillfully in a, in a, technological feat that is similar to the way you would do it now if you were, if you were going to make the same thing. Um, it's, it hasn't been approved, improved upon that much since, since this was made, uh, which was, means that we're, we're very far away from the Venus of Willendorf and just holding a, a small stone in your hand and rubbing it with a, a, a harder stone to, to create little grooves in it. This is this is, is, is sophisticated and it requires a lot of resources to make something like this. Getting copper and getting tin from, from, uh, from the earth, from ores, and smelting them and uh, refining them and getting them together and mixing them in the right proportion. And then making such a thing as this clay mask or ma making, making this at first out of clay and then doing all the very um, difficult and you know technical steps to get from here to the thing made out of bronze is is uh, is an indication of how far they had come in terms of making works of art. So anyway, we have this this work and it's uh, uh, it's made of bronze and and the eyes were made of of probably precious material like I don't know ivory and 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 maybe some some colored stones to to represent the. The, uh, the the color part of the eye, uh, but the eyes, eyes as you see here have been gouged out and, and it's been mutilated, and not just probably to steal the the stone out of it, but to do a, 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 as part of a ritual. That is to take away the power of the thing. This is a, a representation of a of a ruler, somebody who has power, so a spiritual power in a, in addition to military power, and that spiritual power sort of resides in the object. In fact, the object itself would be seen as something that has the power of the king. And so if you were going to, um, you know, conquer these people and take their king's, you know, sculpture, you'd, you'd want to ritualistically remove that power and taking the eyes out would be a, a way to do that. So that explains the, the you know the distortions in it, but how do you explain all of this other stuff? This, the beard. Why is the beard like that? And why is the face like this? And his eyebrows. Look at that. I mean, there's all sorts of interesting things going on in this in this sculpture. Look at the way the this headband is with all the little tiny little grooves in it. And it's that's a very faithful casting to get some such uh, small details in it. And also look at the contrast between the. The way the flesh is rendered and the way the beard is rendered. Um, and think about the terms that I was saying before of, of idealism and uh, naturalism. So um, idealism is when you when you think of a thing and you have many instances of a thing, say an apple, uh, and you want to think of, you know, what's what's the perfect apple look like? Well, you can't find an actual perfect apple because every apple you look at, you know, has some imperfection to it. It's flawed. It's not what you imagine to be the perfect one. But the reason that you can imagine a perfect one is because after looking at a lot of apples, you see that some have good qualities, one, you know, color and shape, and for example, and uh, surface, you know, without any, any, any impurities. And, and after you've seen a lot of them, um, you can sort of picture in your mind what it would look like if you had a perfect apple. Like, if I had an apple that had this skin and this 
shape and you know whatever other characteristics you're you're you're, you're desiring it to have, um, then I can imagine a perfect apple. Well, um, that would be the ideal or idealism, or and the ideal of a thing is something that you don't actually see in the real world, but you just imagine. When you want to represent a person, especially a ruler, and you want to represent him in, in an ideal way, then you then you don't look to see what he actually looks like. You don't see, you know, if he you know, woke up and, and you know, had bed hair that day or something like that. You, you, you want to make him perfect. So this is a version of perfection. That they're that they're that they're after is the way the one, the reason that is like this the reason that you know they've coiled this sort of band around his head to to make this wonderful shape and this the pattern that's on it and the tight geometry that's in it is is all a, a, a very interesting example of some of, of of a desire to make you know the ideal that they want the beard also is not probably what the what the man's beard actually looked like I'm guessing because. This is not really what whiskers look like, but if the whiskers actually have a kind of a twist to them, if they if they are curly, then this is a sort of a distant relative, like a geometricized version of curly hair. It makes a wonderful pattern. It's very very neat looking, and uh, you can see that you know a person looking at this who came from another land and would think, oh, the ruler here must be must be great and powerful and very special in order to, you know, to, to look like this and to, um, you know, command people who could make something like this. It makes them look uh, very sophisticated. Did his eyebrows actually look like this? Well, probably not. It doesn't look like real eye. It looks like a symbol of eyebrows. And did his lips look like this? Well, that's the actual, when I think of the lips and the face and the fleshy parts, well, they actually look pretty real. They look more natural, and on the scale between idealized, like the, like the beard, and a natural look, well, I think the, the, the lips and the nose and, and some of this, maybe a little bit of this, but not quite that, uh, are, are natural features. You know, maybe he did. You, this little wrinkly bit that you have when you raise your eyebrows and then your forehead wrinkles, and it kind of looks like that, but this is still a you know, stylized version of it. But the fleshiness here, the roundness, uh, it makes a wonderful contrast with the with the beard, but you know, it's not natural for such a such a face to to to, to have a line <laughs> uh, separating one from the other. Uh, but this is again a, an ideal thing. So when you look at something like this, you think, all right, what's ideal about it, and what's natural about it? Well, the, the lips, the, the the fleshy part, are kind of natural. Maybe the size of the eyes are not natural; they're they've been increased artificially. Uh, but the Shape of the nose, maybe this is actually the shape of his nose. Maybe it was kind of blunt here, I don't know. Uh, but as we will see in many instances, um, works of art tend to be a, a blend, one or the other, of between, between the, the natural and the ideal. Well, let's move on to the, uh, the victory stele of, of Naram Sin. Stele is a is a, a a stone monument, and this one's about you know six and a half feet tall, and it's made of stone, and it's and it's and it's designed to commemorate uh, a victory in a battle. Here, the Akkadian ruler, probably not the same one, but you can see it seems a, it has a kind of a beard, even though it's you know it's it's weathered and everything. But there's a beard similar to the one we saw, but he's also wearing a a, a different kind of hat, a hat reserved for the gods with the. Uh, the horns on it. He's standing there among a bunch of other people, but he's larger, and he looks more idealized. He looks stronger, more powerful. He's isolated from the background, uh, where everybody else is in a kind of a kind of rows here. You know, these are his minions. Here's there's soldiers here, and they're in ranks, and they're in the same pose that he has, and they also have weapons like he has, but they're smaller. They're Diminutive, so we have a scale uh, to tell you the important guy from the less important guys, and from the important guys and lesser important guys contrasted against the the defeated people, 
that is the dead bodies here, these are the ones who are being defeated, his foot is on one, um, this person has a spear in his neck, and this one is, is sort of running away, that is facing to the right, but also turning back to make a gesture of supplication, like please, please don't kill me. And here's another one here also making a, a gesture of supplication, and their, their spear is broken. Uh, and this is all occurring on a, on a stepped or inclined plane uh, with trees on it. Here's another dead guy hanging here. Uh, trees on it and a big mountain. And he's, it, this must have been the location of where uh, a victory occurred. And this monument is symbolizing that victor victory in a largely symbolic way. Only a few naturalistic elements like trees and the inclination of these steps and you know mountainish kind of shape up here and maybe some stars or sun or astrological things going on up there uh, are commemorating this this event. You can see closer. Uh, it's got some some writing on it too. Uh, this is actually that came later. Once this was made and it was used to show the power of the king and how wonderful it was that he was able to kill all these people and and take over this land. Um, after this ruler was defeated at some point in the future, um, and 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 this Steely was taken by an invading army and taken to some other land, uh, in the other land they decided, you know, we'll keep this and make it our own, and say that this is our our ruler, and they put some uh, writing on it, looks like a cuneiform, to that effect. And that's why we have it, otherwise they would have just destroyed it. Well, uh, this kind of depiction where you have a hierarchy of scale, we're going to see later. The Egyptians do that. We do that too. I mean, it's not, it's not out of the question. If you ever look at movie posters, uh, it's, it happens all the time. Even ones that, that were perfectly naturalistic, photographically naturalistic images of people, sometimes they will show a big person, meaning that's the star of the show, and then little people that are the minor characters in the background, or or even seen transparently through. If you picture the uh, the Star Wars poster, you know it has it has a, it's almost the same thing. It's a great big image of Darth Vader with little images of of, of the lesser uh, characters. Uh, that's just that's that is a convention that we have, and apparently they had as well. It's it it. It works uh, for almost the whole history of art, except uh, just a, a small window where uh, naturalism was was the was the more sought thing. This is a statue of Gudea. Uh, it's actually from Sumer, uh, but later than the Akkadians. There was some sort of period where they sort of. Uh, resurrected for a while, but I'm, we're still calling this Akkadian. Uh, you, can, you can read your book to find the, the details of that. But anyway, this is the, you know, a different kind of ruler, a different representation of a ruler, uh, seen as a standing uh, stone figure. Um, and this would be one of you know a dozen such things that were placed in all the different temples in the land. Uh, and you see, this ruler is not trying to, to express his military power. He doesn't look military at all. He looks more like a, a wise ruler and a more benevolent sort of ruler ruling with, with, you know, with his mind because he's so smart looking. He, he looks wise uh, rather than the, uh, the, previous, the previous work that we saw. Oh, did I mention the fact that he had, that this guy here had, had arrows and stuff and, and a bow and arrow and a spear and then blades and you know, whatever else that he needs, a little axe here, or adds, or whatever, whatever that is. I mean, he's, he's, he's really armed, like Rambo or something. But this one uh, is, is much different. The proportions are different. He doesn't look threatening. Uh, it, it looks almost like he's a life giver. I can say that because, you know, he's holding in his hand a vessel uh, out of which water is coming. It's a symbolic-looking water that's sort of, you know, uh, a convention where water is represented as waves or linear waves that come down and out of the, you know, out of the vessel, and it's got little fish on it. Well, fish have scales, 
and it just goes down, and it's, it's as though he is holding the source of a river. And the river, of course, in Mesopotamia is where life comes, because otherwise they'd be in the desert. And, and being uh, a life giver is, is, would be one of his attributes that is being, is being communicated with the thing. But it's not just communicated literally with, with water and, and, and you know, symbols of water and holding the water and it coming out. It's, it's doing, no, no, it's literally with, with words here. And it's, this, this is, has it hit the laws that he has and the order that he's bringing. Um, but look at the, just the, the form of it. His arms are very round and, and soft. And the, all of, all of the, the forms, everything transitioned from one thing to another in a smooth, round, non-threatening manner. And his proportions, look at his proportion. He, he looks, almost childlike in, in, in innocence or in um, non-threateningness, I guess. Um, you know, little chubby face, great big eyes, showing wisdom, uh, his eyebrows. Eyebrows were similar to the other guy. Must have been a convention that, that, that they wanted to keep. But the, the fleshy face and the uh, all things looked like he's, um, you know, a well, well-fed figure, which means that he's... That he's uh, uh, is another aspect of his life giving. Uh, he's plenty, and plentiness, plentitude, and and uh, and fertility, and all that are all co communicated by this figure. Okay, so those are the the Akkadians. Now, let's move on to the Assyrians. The Assyrians would be the the, the next group. Uh, who came after, and they would build uh, you know, just like the, the, the previous previous did, the, the ziggurats, these great big monuments and big, big uh, uh, city walls and, and made out of brick and, and uh, palaces that were raised up above the plain and, uh, and temples and things. Um, the the tower, tower of Babylon was a ziggurat. And this is, this is this is in that place. There's lots of ziggurats around, and there's, sometimes there's just a mound of dirt still there. They probably face uh, or make a wall out of out of uh, out of out of bricks, and then maybe two walls with with filling it in with 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 earth, and to 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 make a raised platform upon which you would build a temple or a palace. And this is this is an example from from a from a palace that was built on one of these, and the palace was made out of brick, but it was faced with stone. Stone uh, up in the further northern part of of, uh, of 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 Mesopotamia, they had access to some stone, but it was way up in the north in the mountains. In the alluvial plain, there was very little stone, and and it was hard to get. You had to, you had to bring it. Uh, I forgot to mention that in this figure, this this stone is very very hard. Uh, I think it's diorite, I think it's called, and it's extremely hard to work, and it's very rare to get, and even to. You can imagine the trouble it is to get it from wherever it is it came from. You know, first to find it, and then to, to quarry it, and then bring it, and, and then and then carve it. Um, but when you you do this for the purpose of making something timeless, so that it lasts forever. In this instance, the purpose of bringing this stone here one one is to make the make it look as if the entire palace is made out of stone. By you know, even though it's brick and mud and stuff on the inside, it's stone on the outside, so it looks like it's made out of stone. Another thing is that when you have visitors, uh, you want them to be impressed with the power of the king, and so the king um, um, has all these works made, the the hallways and the, the the ramps and things. When you walk up the steps to get to his palace, you have to go by all these pictures, and the pictures show the king, and this is the one called the lion hunt, but there's also pictures of him defeating enemies and uh, something along the lines of that victory, Stella of Naram Sin, where you have, you know, the king victorious over, over fallen foes and, you know, lots of armies and lots of, you know, fallen foes. Uh, but this is, is, you know, showing the king doing something that isn't a, a war thing, but a, a ritualistically killing lions, showing at the same time that he's very powerful, powerful enough to kill lions, and that you know he's special, and and the power of the lions uh, that they're exaggerating here 
uh, by showing them threatening him and everything, uh, by, by emphasizing their fierceness and their, their threat, it's, it's adding to the, uh, you know, the, the character of the king and that he's, he's able to overcome this. This, is, this. this piece of stone is maybe like over eight feet long, I mean, three or four feet tall. Uh, it depicts the king in the middle in a chariot pulled by horses. And there's two lines, one, one coming from the rear and, and is rearing up, and the one underneath the, the horse's hooves as the horses sort of leap forward. Uh, I say the horses because we see one big horse right in the front there, but the others are uh, back there too. You see two more uh, in, a, in, a, in a convention that what we could call is a, a, a way to depict more things going back into space, even though space-wise, this is a very flat image. Uh, even the three-dimensional chariot uh, is, is represented by a flat thing. This, the drawing sort of indicates that it may be that it goes around and it's apparently going around his body and, and making a, a platform upon which him to stand and to, you know, uh, house him. And the, the wheel uh, that we see is everything is, is, is represented as circular, like we're looking straight on at the wheel. Uh, and and these, these other shapes here look like trash can lids or symbols of some sort. Uh, and the poses, every, everything we're seeing in a profile view, so that uh, you can see it clearly, and also that it matches the shape of the format. The movement is from left to right. You can see the, the first movement over here is, is vertical. It, it takes, takes part in the, uh, uh, the vertical nature of the left side of the format and these people are walking to the right and they're, they start out as, as this vertical line but then you get into this uh, organic line that sort of sweeps over to the right and sweeps upward towards the face of the, of the, uh, of the ruler here. And this continues on in, another, in a kind of a, a wave, like a, a, a wave crescent going up with this route and going through here. And, and, and coming out this way. So it's, it's, it flows from left to right and makes in these, this con continuity of the edge between the, uh, between the lions back here and the, and the arrow here are, are, are ways or, 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 or formal elements that the artist is using to unify the picture and to make, create this, this, this motion. It's not, it's not a, uh, uh, it's not, not terribly uh, motive. The, the, it, 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 it moves in a, in a gentle slowness, uh, which has the effect of giving the, the, the ruler um, this quality where he's sort of in control of everything. He's right on the central axis. He's not leaning forward. He's not leaning back. He's just right on the central axis, and he's uh, in control of everything, and he's, he's going to get the lion. He's already got this one, and this one's dying. And that he's in, everybody's in control of these horses. They're not. They're not running away wildly, and there's nothing, you know, jagged or, or threatening about it. He's got it. He's powerful, and he's got everything under control. You see that the um, the way this is depicted is is it's interesting, and in that this is the, the figures and the ground are both made out of the same same material. This is a relief, so that they whatever this material is, I think it's, it's limestone or gypsum or something, uh, is. Is, is carved into you know, very shallowly and and the shapes of things the three-dimensional shapes of animals parts are rendered as you can see you know the way light breaks over and gives the impression that there's they have more volume than they actually have you know this, it may only uh, rise from the surface a couple of inches but it looks like you know there's this you know relatively strong illusion that there's some sort of volume going on here and that's a, that's a sophisticated thing. Um, it also has some stylization, so what I would call this, these little grooves to indicate linear patterns that represent the separations between one muscle group or one uh, uh, tendon and another uh, within the lion's body, within, I think, even the legs of this guy here, uh, to separate things in a, in a linear way, whereas other parts, like, like this little bit, little bit of tonal change here, all indicate the, uh, the surface changes within, within the figure uh, to show that it's a, a three-dimensional object. The little uh, 
roundness of the arms and everything. Yeah, what else can I say about this? Notice there are some some things that are that are natural about this. You can recognize everything, even though there's a little bit of you know absence of naturalism in terms of these linear patterns. But uh, it's natural. Uh, the the way the horse moves here it seems seems pretty natural. Uh, the have the convention of having the three horses. Perhaps they're just lined up perfectly, almost just so you can see a little bit of the three you know the two horses behind it. Uh, but you know you know the these these horses probably have a lot of space. I mean, if three horses had side by side, or you know, going to be you know ten, twelve, fifteen feet of space going back into into the depths. But since this is a flat thing, you can't represent that. So you have this convention. But notice that you know there's there's two horses back here, but there's only three legs, he, represented here and and here. So there's some distortion going on, um, just because it's they, they, they're showing just what's necessary for you to read the picture and, and nothing more. Okay, that's, that's, that's enough for this one. I'll, I'll, uh, I will do another one and start, start with the Egyptians on the next one.